The former Ontario Liberal government canceled a plan for a GTA West Highway, but the idea for a new link between Highway 400 in Vaughan and Highway 407 near Milton is back under the current PC government, which calls it an important piece of transportation infrastructure. Critics, however, say that it's an outmoded approach. With us now on what new road projects such as this one need to do and anticipate over the long term, we welcome Jane Fogel, councillor for the town of Halton Hills and a member of the Halton Regional Council. Todd Letts, CEO of the Brampton Board of Trade. Teresa DeFelice, Assistant Vice President of Government and Community Relations for the Canadian Automobile Association of South Central Ontario. And Stephen Farber, Assistant Professor in the Department of Human Geography at the University of Toronto Scarborough. And it's good to have everybody here around our table tonight for a discussion about something that uh, either is desperately needed or is a terrible idea. And we're going to discuss it in the next half an hour. Let's start off with the Minister of Transportation for the Province of Ontario, Caroline Mulrooney, who had this to say about the GTA West Transportation Corridor. Sheldon, if you would. It was a promise that we made during the election. Uh, the GTA West Corridor, we believe, is an important transportation uh, piece of transportation infrastructure that's needed, uh, as you know, because so many of you live in this, in this region. Um, congestion is increasing, and I think by 2031, there'll be a million and a half more drivers um, in this area, which is going to add something like 27 more minutes to to the commute, and so so there is a need for additional transportation infrastructure. And let's follow that up by just showing you where this thing is. And again, for people listening on podcast who can't see the map, I'll describe it in some detail. We're looking at a map of the Greater Toronto Area, sort of west of Toronto and north. So we're talking north of Brampton right now. And it starts on Jane Street in the east, which is Highway 400 essentially. And there's a green swath that kind of goes west and south. Uh, I guess kind of crossing Highway 10 in Caledon and Brampton here on Ontario Street and eventually coming down to the 407 right around Trafalgar Road in Halton Region. And it's a kind of, a, if you think about it, kind of a green swath that goes west and then south. North of Brampton, still Peel Region, but south of Bolton and Caledon. And that's the idea for this new GTA West you know, highway. We'll see what happens with that. Todd, start us off here. Is this a good idea to build this thing? Yeah, Steve, it's a very good idea. Actually, it's more than that. It's essential because I think it helps families to navigate the realities of uh, modern uh, life in the GTA. I guess what I mean by that is we're welcoming new neighbors to the uh, GTA uh, by the millions. You know, in the next 10, 11 years, we'll have 4 million people in Brampton. We welcome about 14,000 uh, each uh, year. Wait and a second, did you say 4 million people in Brampton? No, 4 million across the GTA, but 14,000 new residents are welcomed in Brampton I every okay. year. And that puts a stress on uh, our highways. Now, it's a good thing, though, because they're also consumers, and that's the second thing that's changing, uh, consumer behavior. The, it, the demand for products and products delivered to our door uh, is also uh, very high because of the uh, online uh, uh, shopping that e-commerce. So you think a new, a new highway is going to be needed to deal with all of that? As, as well. And, and then there's the mobile. Uh, okay. Well, don't uh, give me a hundred yeah, reasons yeah, off the top yeah. here because I want to get everybody else in <laughs> first. Okay. Jane, your view on whether this is needed? Well, we know that there is traffic problems. There's no doubt about that. It's finding the right solution for them. And both Halton Region and the town of Halton Hills have uh, declared climate emergencies, as have Milton, Oakville, and Burlington, uh, the City of Toronto, the federal government. We've had reports yesterday about just how serious this is. I would see this as, as possibly the first test of our resolve to view everything through a climate lens. And Clearly, a new 400 series highway is only going to add to our greenhouse gas emissions, not reduce them. We need a solution that reduces them. Teresa, your view. Well, I think we have some numbers that, you know, we can definitely share. CA commissioned a, a bottleneck study looking at all the bottlenecks in Canada and what that means. And, and just for this area alone, specifically the 400 north of the, the city of Toronto that serves these areas as, as well, you know, we are talking about 21 kilometers of highway causing 4 million hours of delay, um, 7.6 million uh, litres of fuel that's wasted, 
20 million kilograms of CO2 emissions um, that could be saved if we could get, get rid of these bottlenecks. And so I think we have that lens to look through is, is what's the cost of not doing it as well as if we do it, what's the benefit that we're going to get out of it and how do we use hindsight uh, from how we don't want things built to actually create the right modal situation in this scenario. Stephen. Yeah. Um, no, I don't um, support the building of the new highway. I think that um, all of the evidence shows that uh, new highways encourage unsustainable urban development. Uh, car-dependent, uh, sprawling neighborhoods, which are unhealthy, unsustainable, and economically inefficient in the long run. And I also think that decades of research, as well as personal experience in the GTA region, shows that building new highways and expanding existing highways does nothing to help us with um, uh, decreasing travel times in the region. In fact, it's just the opposite. It doesn't alleviate traffic. It actually, if you build it, they will come? Exactly. Huh, okay. Teresa, the CAA did a report on Canada's worst bottlenecks a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Where are the worst bottlenecks? So the 401 actually has the, the most bottlenecks, and we did a C Canadian comparison, but what was really uh, sort of alarming or for most people was that some of our worst bottlenecks here in Toronto along the 401, in particular the western quarter of the 401, are also part of the north, top 20 in North America, comparing with cities like Los Angeles and New York. And how convinced are you that if this GTA West Highway were built, that those bottlenecks would be lessened as opposed to just creating a whole bunch of new ones? So the, we did the study, but also we talked about solutions. And so, you know, the possibility of building road infrastructure shouldn't be the main source of, of solutions for, for getting rid of gridlock. I think that we, we support a transit first policy. And I think that we're seeing that the big move is that from Metrolinx is really situated around looking at transit as a most effective and efficient way to move people around. Um, and I think that there are other things that we could do. We talk about as a result of the study, other solutions like maximizing current things. So how can you address the bottlenecks with things like ramp metering? Uh, maybe it's just the widening lanes of highway or better efficient feed throughs, um, ensuring that multimodal mix that you're finding ways for other pe ways for people to get around. I'm sorry, you do a multimodal mix? What does that mean? A multimodal mix is so that if people want to, you know, do part of their trip by transit, if they're walking, if they're cycling, we have to make sure the infrastructure is there for all of it, right? Like even currently when we build bicycle lanes, there is this little bit of, but we don't have as many cyclists as we do cars on the road. Mm. But at the same time, we're saying, but we know that that mode share, that type, way of getting around is growing. And therefore, we're building the, the, the framework for it to be safe and efficient way of getting cyclists around and that mixed use traffic. Okay. Can I get the map back up, Sheldon, for a second? Because I want to put a question to Todd. There's the map again. Now, Brampton is south of where this new proposed highway would go. So tell me how you think Brampton's congestion and other, you know, difficulties in terms of transportation would be alleviated by building this new highway, which is frankly north of most of the city. It's right along the border between uh, Caledon and uh, and Brampton, yeah. and that's very strategic uh, for um, employers and manufacturers uh, in the city. It would really help us uh, f to get. Uh, uh, employees to work on time. It's a very mobile uh, lifestyle now. Uh, people don't always live as close to their workplace as uh, they did in the past. And getting to work on time, getting raw materials to manufacturers on time so that goods can be delivered to customers uh, on time are very important. And this highway will add uh, to the economy significantly. Okay. Again, Sheldon, I'm going to ask you to bring up the map one more time because I want to put a question to Jane Fogel. Halton Hills, Show us where on this map, um, the, how close to Halton Hills this um, proposed highway would go and the impact you think it would have on Halton Hills. Well, it's in the bottom left corner there is where the highway it, it dives south to join up with the 401, 407 interchange. And that's now, Halton region. Yes, Halton Hills is in Halton region. Yeah. So right now, that interchange is a mess. It, it creates its own its own gridlock. You're talking 401, 407? 401, 407. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to bring another highway in there, another 400 series highway with how many movements are there going to be? How Can you go west and then keep going west or can you go south? How, do, how does that all work? I, I would anticipate that that's going to cause a bigger bottleneck than the one that we have already. And, and really, if you look at this highway as it was originally 
uh, conceived, it was supposed to go directly north and just keep going, not do that dive down. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to connect over to Guelph and Kitchener to take the traffic from Guelph and Kitchener off the 401. Well, now this isn't going to do that because they're still going to come to that 401, 407 on the 401. And now what do they do? Okay, so if they were inclined to take a toll road, they'd take the 407. It's there and it's underutilized. Or they're not taking a toll, they're going to go 401 still. Now we, we propose another highway, which the engineers suggest might also be a toll road. It's taking you to the same place as a toll road you haven't chosen before. It only I, ends up 10 kilometers north on mm, the 400. Can I get Stephen on this, just on the notion of you've got two superhighways mm -hmm. that are already com, you know, connecting with each other. If you add a third, and I guess mm -hmm. it would be called the 413? Yes. Is that the idea? Yeah. So if you've got 401, 407, and a future 413 mm -hmm. all coming together, what are the implications? Yeah, I think that we have to come to terms in this region about congestion and our problem of congestion. And um, I firmly believe that we will never eliminate congestion in the GTA. We're too large a city. We're too sprawled as it is, too low density as it is. And building new highways can never actually solve the congestion problem because cars are fundamentally an inefficient way to move masses of people throughout an enormous region like our own. And I really need to th think that we need to stop thinking about how we solve congestion and instead shift the problem and shift the solutions to how do we move more people in our region without them becoming the congestion? And the answer to that presumably is more public transit. It's more public transit. It's better and more efficient use of our existing uh, road and highway infrastructure, and I've got details for how that could look as well. <laughs> it's about pricing policies, and it's about better land use and transportation integration policies. In pricing policies meaning you got to pay to use the roads. Exactly. To, to, to drive on the roads. You should be, yes. Right now, one of the reasons why we have so much congestion in our region is that the full cost of travel by car is, is um, not being met by the drivers who are making the decision to drive. And that leads to a lot of excess driving. And one of the best known ways that uh, we can solve that problem is by putting a nominal charge on uh, car-based trips. I'm sure the Canadian Automobile Association <laughs> agrees with everything you just said. <laughs> he well, said tongue-in-cheek. This isn't a, something that we've heard of, obviously, in the past, you know, whether drivers should be paying more, the argument that drivers don't pay for the roads. Uh, you know, we have other research that we've done that around what it, money is collected um, that is borne by the driver for the roads that they use versus things like, uh, you know, some of the externalities like impact on health care or environment. Uh, but then you also talk about new infrastructure and how do you pay for new infrastructure. So I would say that part of the money that's collected from drivers now has gone into things like funding the transit um, network that we're trying to build. Uh, but we know that there's not enough money for the infrastructure that we have and that we need. You know, I think that when it comes to tolls, there has to be a clear argument because part of the problem that we have is sometimes we come out and we hear that drivers should pay tolls because they're a burden on, on the system. Sometimes we hear it's about getting revenue so we can create um, efficiencies and, and, and alleviate other problems and grow transit. And other times it's, you know, just about creating revenue. And all of those are very different things. And I think some of the work we've done said is if you're going to go down the road of road pricing, we're not really sort of maybe sitting on the fence a little bit around why or when you do that. Mm -hmm. You have to be clear, because right now there's not a public ap appetite. There's an affordability issue. Mm -hmm. There's not alternatives. The transit isn't there. If, if you decided to put a toll on the roads, all the highways tomorrow, how would you handle the number of people who decide to come out of their vehicles? Um, and because we don't have that infrastructure in place now. So mm -hmm. there's a number of things that we have to grapple with in order to mm -hmm. have this conversation and whether it's something the policymakers want to move towards. To and Steve, I just wanted to uh, touch uh, based on something that uh, Jane said with respect to um, the new opportunities that the highway uh, offers. It's not going to the same place. We're really connected regionally now. Our academic institutions, our manufacturers, the tech uh, uh, hubs in, at Venture Labs in York region, uh, Communitech in Waterloo region, and this is uh, uh, opens up a brand new set of opportunities for companies, for students, uh, for researchers uh, to work together uh, all along that corridor, even in the new uh, hubs that are happening in uh, in Brampton. Stephen. Sorry, but going back to the, uh, the charging for uh, mm -hmm. option, um, 
One of the, the major reasons to support a congestion charge um, is, is actually something called travel demand management, which is um, not an argument that we're trying to raise money for capital projects uh, or infrastructure projects, but instead that we're trying to impose a charge on driving in order to reduce the excess driving that currently happens in our region. And we know that there is um, a lot of evidence that shows that there are large numbers of people on the margin who would be swayed away from driving, who would be able to be accommodated by transit solutions, changing the time that they're participating in trips. Can I just understand that? Is that yes. so, so you might put a congestion charge on the road in rush hour, but not right. at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And if, and if, uh, if that results in 100,000 people deciding to travel at 10 a.m. instead of 9 a.m., we can have massive improvements in the efficiencies of our road system. But why, and, why penalize Ontarians and, a, and why restrict their hmm. choices and, and options uh, by not having a highway? We need so that both we highways and we need uh, new transit. Two-way all day go along the Kitchener line is an important uh, solution. It'll bring another $17 uh, billion uh, uh, million dollars a year uh, for uh, our GDP as well as 170,000 more uh, jobs. And that's part of the solution along with a new GTA What's highway. It, who, who knows what the cost of this highway would be? Fully funded. It's, Who knows what it I, would be? I was looking it up, and it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars. I, I thought it would be a billion, but it's less I did than too. that. I, it, so less it's, under a billion. From what I could figure out, I don't know when those Google, figures are from. Yeah, yeah I'm not. I'm not. But too I sure. guess the question I'm getting at is, if you let's just for argument's sake say it's 500 million bucks, is this the wisest expenditure of 500 million dollars no. in order to do all of the different things that the people at this table want to do, Jane? I think we're in a transition period. We have to recognize that we do have climate change issues and we have to keep talking about that, not get moved over to, well, we've got some goods to move, so we have to do that, which is a short-term solution. You only have to look at LA to see how oh. how it works with more highways. Jane, they I don't, just clog, I, I don't think it's up. either or. I don't think it's cool. uh, environment or uh, convenience and, and the economy. I think we can build one of the smartest highways in North America with this GTA uh, Highway 413. There, how are you uh, defining smart? Uh, uh, I'm talking about intelligent uh, uh, transportation systems, uh, messaging uh, on signs, uh, new technologies in the asphalt uh, that's uh, that's used, mm -hmm. um, uh, long combined uh, vehicles. Uh, etc. Um, we can make this uh, uh, an environmentally responsible highway and improve our uh, economy at the same time. It's, it's not, a, it's, yeah. it's, it's not uh, an either or situation. It, I think it, it is. It seems to me that you're talking about these um, technologies that may or may not uh, come to fruition or may or may not exist Automated yet. vehicles. But I, I absolutely uh, agree that we can make our, our highways more efficient using technology. But why start with a new corridor on our, our uh, you know, r urban rural fringe to implement those technologies? Why not start with the 401 and the DVP and the 404 and make those existing pieces of infrastructure absolutely as efficient as possible today with ITS, with HOT lanes, uh, high occupancy tolling lanes, uh, getting them ready for um, um, more self-driving technologies and things like that, and having transit lanes on all of this infrastructure to move many more people on the existing roads. Let's avoid spending the $500 million altogether on a new highway because we can... We, we can we, make our existing we can't system build so much a wall more efficient. around the GTA. We're a very attractive magnet. We're going to be attracting four million more people. We need another highway. Well, and I think what happens is we have to remember that that this can't be the sole solution. So there are a number of plans. This is not a new proposal. This has been in, in existence and identified in a number of you know Greater Toronto Horseshoe planning. Um, in the big move by Metrolinx when that was brought together. So this has been identified a number of times as a need for the growing population. And so I, th I think what we have to think about is, is what can we take the hindsight from how we don't want it built, the ways of the past, and if we're going to go ahead and build it, because right now we're doing an environmental assessment, that'll, you know, there's a number of municipalities, a number of voices that have to come into this debate, but if we're going to go ahead and build it, what can we learn from the way we don't want it to happen? But it's a, not a one-thing one solution. This won't be the only thing that okay. needs to be done. You mentioned population, and I, I've got a graphic that I want. Sheldon, can you have somebody in that control room flip a switch and bring that up? Here we go. Beautiful. And for those listening on podcast, I'll just describe this a little bit. This is the population for the city of Brampton from the years 2000. 2001 to 2016, and then with a forecast 
22 years into the future as well. And this is a city, I hasten to remind everybody, when Bill Davis was a Premier of Ontario, it was less than 100,000 people. And now, as of the year 2001, it climbs up to a close to 400,000. And by 2011, it's up close to 600,000. And the projections in the future have this city going north of 800,000 people, uh, you know, maybe touching a million. Uh, a million people in Brampton, can you imagine? Yeah. Uh, maybe by the, by the year 2050. Uh, for those on this side of the table then, Jane, if those population forecasts are accurate, and at the moment, you yes. know, they mm -hmm. kind of seem to be, does that help their side of the argument? Well, no, it doesn't. Because if you compare to other cities in the world, and I was just looking at Copenhagen, that has a population of under 600,000, they've got a subway system in that size of, of population. They just opened a new subway with 17 stops on it. In Toronto, we're arguing about one or two stops on a subway. They're so much further ahead. And when you travel the world, you see how poor our investment has been in transit, in public transit. I mean, they have a, a transit, a metro stop within 650 meters of every station. I mean, the people can get to one within 650 meters. Hmm. Of a subway, not a bus, that's what they're doing. And that just opened uh, in September, the latest one. And they got another one happening. They're putting the money in to take the cars off the road so that the highways that we've got aren't over capacity. So you, you, there's only so much money. But I think the thing to remember is the plans that we, so we understand the regret of what we didn't build in the past, which is why we're aggressively trying to build transit and we're, we're adding more plans to those, you know, transit lines and transit stops and uh, to try and not only make up for lost time, but catch up and build for the future. And so, you know, we know what it means to have that regret because of what we didn't do. The, the big move was not to actually resolve congestion. It was to keep it at the current levels. Mm -hmm. The big move was designed, all that transit planning and the road infrastructure planning that was put in that was to actually maybe in the interim save 20 minutes, but that when we get to 2031, the congestion is flat at where we're experiencing it mm -hmm. now when, when we know that the quality of life, our economy, um, the environment is all impacted by what we have now. So it's just to keep it at that level. Can I put a new idea on the table here and get some discussion about this, mm -hmm. which is somebody mentioned smart, I think it was you, Todd, mentioned yeah. a smart, what if we make it a smart highway? Okay, let's define that. What if this were a highway where only autonomous vehicles were usable or battery powered cars were usable, or I guess trucks, because you got to deliver goods to market? Stephen, would that help you support it more if it were only limited to that kind of clientele? No, I mean, absolutely not. Uh, now you're talking about building a hugely expensive piece of infrastructure just for the margin of people who are going to be able to afford autonomous vehicles and, and be able to drive them around. So I, I'm not in favor, that doesn't sway the but equation It does me. speak to the issue of climate change, though, in some... If oh, you, if there if are you, electric vehicles. If there's electric vehicles allowed. Sure, except that we still have the massive urbanization around the highway corridor that's going to come as a result of this new infrastructure which is going to have detrimental impact to the environment as well. Uh, the corridor goes, I, I don't, the green belt wasn't on the map, but I'm sure it goes through the green belt or very close to the green belt. This is our precious natural reserve for our region that we really do need to protect for sustainability purposes, for the long-term viability of our region. And building a new highway corridor within a stone's throw of that amazing natural resource is gonna put tremendous development pressure there and it really puts the sustainability of our region at risk. Let me put, uh, put this to Todd and I'll, I'll ask you if you, could, if you could live with the restrictions that it would only be autonomous battery powered vehicles or people who drive battery powered cars or okay, some trucks that have gotta deliver goods to market, but not everybody. It's not gonna be a free for all which is gonna turn it into another parking lot. Would you be able to live with those restrictions on it? Stephen, I don't know why we want to restrict uh, Ontarians. I think that uh, uh, the market will uh, demand how many autonomous vehicles and how many electric uh, trucks uh, go on that hi highway. And it's part of a, a, a solution with two-way all-day go transit, with inter-LRT uh, 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 to Jane's uh, point. And let's not forget the third part of the solution, which is intermodal uh, rail, so that more uh, goods can be uh, 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 transferred to customer from manufacturer 
on uh, on freight uh, rail. The M Milton Logistics Hub is in uh, this district as well and is another big part of uh, the solution for uh, uh, growing our economy and the livability and quality of life in the GTA. Stephen. Yeah, I'm struggling with the notion that we can do it all and that it's all needed. And I think that actually when people make travel decisions, they are um, looking at the relative costs for themselves over whether or not they should take a transit, bike, or drive their car. And by simultaneously making car travel more convenient and cheaper, um, uh, through the through the expansive, you know, through expanding our infrastructure, we are uh, putting that decision, uh, see, we're, see, we're, we're, we're making, you're saying that we can make both goods cheaper at the in, same time, both on, car travel and transit, and that won't actually shift any drivers in into Ontario, transit. In Ontario, we're already spending twice as much on transit as we are on highways, and that might be a reasonable uh, ratio. But let's talk about the real lives of Ontarians. The opportunity cost of not having this highway means that job offers are, are being declined because uh, talented people uh, think that their commute is going to be too uh, do we, lengthy. Do we know to that for a fact? We know that for a fact. I spoke to the president of Canon Canada yesterday. But that's a rational decision to live closer to your exactly. work. Exactly. You, oh. you don't have the God-given right to live, but you know, the market reality is that you away. can make more money if you uh, travel more than 30 uh, kilometers from your your home. And the reality is that people are we're we're not just talking about municipal boundaries anymore. We're talking about an innovation corridor all the way from uh, Waterloo to Toronto, and that's just the re the reality of what uh, uh, talented people uh, want in their lifestyles and the competitive. Uh, necessity to help us uh, compete with other jurisdictions like Silicon Valley okay. and Europe. A couple of minutes left here, and I want to ask the politician a political question. <laughs> okay. This thing's going to take a decade, right, to, to happen Absolute, one absolutely. way or the other. The previous Liberal mm. government didn't want it. Yes. The current Conservative government does want it. Yes. Uh, you know, is there a political solution here, do you think, at the end of the day? Well, I mean, the Liberals decided that, I guess, they couldn't do it all. And they, had, and they were seeing that there was new technology coming along and they wanted to take a pause in order to assess what is the best route forward. So then the Conservatives come in and say, well, it's highways because we've always done highways. I would still say this is not the, the right solution and there isn't that much money in the pot. We ha and we have to do climate change. So, but I'm wondering if you think you can change this government's mind, or is I, the solution to just unelect these guys? We've got 10 years. S S <laughs> Steve, <laughs> it's all about balance. It could be balance. a different government. I, I mean, I think, it, to be fair, I think this Minister of Transportation has a very good handle on the transit needs and the highway needs. And in this particular design of the highway, there will be allocation for a transitway if sometime in the future we want to uh, twin it with transit as well. I think last it should just seconds. be a truckway. I mean, just make it a truckway and don't build the rest. Stephen, last 30 seconds. Well, I think that, all, you know, uh, there was an, ad an expert advisory panel to, to look at this highway uh, in 2014. The report yeah. was available for some time, and it's now not available anymore on MTO's website, so I'm not exactly sure what it contains, except that there was um, a strong piece of advice that said that uh, we are not doing enough to make the rest of our transportation system efficient, that we should be looking at other alternatives right now, and that we shouldn't be considering doing it all. We have to be efficient with our time here, and sadly, our time is up. But I want to thank Todd Letts from the Brampton Board of Trade and Teresa DeFelice from CAA South Central Ontario on one side of the table, and Jane Fogel from the town of Halton Hills and Halton Region, and Stephen Farber, the Assistant Professor in the Department of Human Geography at U of T Scarborough, for coming into TVO tonight and having this wonderful civilized debate. Thanks for having <laughs> thank me. You. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.